नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया Live from Hastinapur, New Delhi, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator of the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to India. We made it to India. Woo! We're sitting a bunch of people packed in my hotel room. We're getting ready to go to Jagannath Puri tomorrow. Con- considered, well, you know, to every everybody, every every Hindu that's in India considers Jagannath Puri as one of the four holy doms, holy holes, Chardam. Dom, right? It's the one of the char doms of India. And it's a very, very special place. They say everybody who takes birth there is a four armed uh, associate of Lord Vishnu. It's a special place. It's not an ordinary place. And usually when I lead a pilgrimage, we work up to going to Vrindavan. We start off in Rishikesh, which is sort of an easy in. It's got the Ganga. It's got the Himalayas. It's got, you know, it's very charming. And then we sort of slowly work our way into Vrindavan. And we get the focus in how to enter into that, um, you know, transcendental realm. These guys, we're starting them right off diving into the deep water in Jagannath Puri. I'm really excited. I'm super excited. Harry Bowl. Yeah. Um, Harry Bell, Kostuba, how are you? What? Wait a second, Kostuba. This is like eighth grade. What? Are you wearing like a concert T-shirt? What? Only eighth graders wear concert T-shirts? Well, I'm just remember fla- I'm having high school flashbacks, like ACDC, Those are Little Skinner, Rush, <laughs> Those are all- <laughs> Jay Blue Giles Oyster Band, <laughs> Blue Oyster. I had a Blue Oyster called Belt Buckle, by the way. No, isn't that sad? ELO. ELO. Oh, ELO. I had an ELO belt buckle. How do you know? You remember that? Because you told, told us. That. Okay. Yeah, this is my John oh, Let me see. Harrison. Put, it's a John uh, Harrison concert shirt. My Just like a river through the sea. She should have made a black one. It's they white. Have, uh, she's, she's a sattvic person. Right? Yeah, I, mean, I get it. I get it. But concert was off the charts last night. Right? Was it good? The magic was flowing. Were you dancing? Tell me. Yeah, at one point. Were you like on on your seat? No, we were in the standing aisle. on your chair in the aisle. In the but it aisles. was beautiful. You know, she uh, first of all saw so many uh, others there and met met new people that I hadn't met before. They're listening to the show. One, thank you so much for coming up to me and sharing your thoughts. And of course, saw so many old friends there as well. So many wisdom of the sages people, and. Um, Beautiful, like Broadway theater, you know. And so uh, cool. She just killed it, you know. She she's got all this new material that she's doing. She kind of op- you know, kind of mostly started with that, or did a lot of that towards the beginning, and then did some of the classics. And uh, phew, did she know, do my favorite? Just like a river. My heart. Bam bam yeah. bam. That was flows like, like a river. That was like more yeah. towards the end, where it's kind of like hitting that one of those classics, and then everyone's like, "Yeah, you know, like that." Right, that one right, really right. That's everyone. cool. It was absolutely beautiful, and she just, you know, sometimes she just um, starts singing and just, whew, just unbelievable. Great band. Everyone in the band was absolutely um, talented, super talented. But you know, she had some. You know how we were calling yesterday, um, Inner Friend Friday. Inner Friend Friday, yeah. No she friend. We call loose... it No Friend Friday at first, but Inner Friend Friday is the better <laughs> Inner Friend Friday option. So, yeah. So, so she she has this new material. She, she she was playing some songs she's never played before live. Like nobody's heard them before. Yeah. And um, they were uh, very introspective songs. They were like prayers. You know, like like speaking to God in the heart. Hmm. And um, and they were very like really vulnerable songs. You know. Um, and, uh, which, and she would sing them, you know, just like, you know, she can just like soar, you know, and, uh, it was really, you know, everybody was just holding back the tears, you know, trying to hold back the tears. It was very beautiful. Did you cry? A little bit. I was, I was, I was a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever cried? Oh, oh, oh. I was a little bit. I mean, honestly, I was. I was kind of trying to tearing up a little bit over there. Um, but it it was. I want to really see Kostuba cry. 
<laughs> you want to make me cry? <laughs> Do you really want to uh, make me cry, Ragnar? Do you really want to hurt me? Oh, very good. Very good, Kostuba. Um, so, uh, it was a beautiful right. night. It was, and, uh, you know, it was a great way to kick off her tour. Anybody, if you're going to be in the Atlanta area, Dallas area, L.A. area, Chicago area, you don't want to miss it. It was really beautiful. Beautiful. Right. Speaking of others, me and Mara were at the food court last night across the street. At I'm Pricano getting a little Wally. bit concerned here that, that you two are at seeing this pilgrimage is just like a shopping spree. <laughs> Mara was a little bit late and <laughs> The program as a matter of fact it's the show didn't even get up everything yesterday. here in new delhi you know she had a big shot all kind of new clothes and everything this is not a materialistic pursuit this pilgrimage i want you two to understand this okay i know that i'm trying get to out of the her. starbucks I'm trying to ease okay. her into this get out of the starbucks <laughs> <laughs> all right so well so. anyway anyway we met another we met a random other who came up to me it was like raganoff i cannot believe you are here I listen to Wisdom of Sages every day. I'm from London. He was Indian, but from London, he was visiting. And he goes, I'm trying to catch up. I'm on episode 600. I go, you want me to really blow your mind? That's Mara over there. He's like, you're kidding. <laughs> and he ran up to Mara. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was our day today. Okay. Got some harmoniums. Oh, you want harmonium and got shopping, some. Yeah. That guy must yeah. love you at that shop every time you bring a whole crew of people over there. I didn't bring a whole crew this time. Oh. They all went on a tour. It, no one was here. Everyone just got here and they just showed up in my room right like five minutes ago. I see. So, all right, let's go on with the show, sir. Any right. announcements, Mira? We're back to your recovery group at 9.30 this morning. And um, Kustuba, do you want to speak about tomorrow's guest? For yeah, we have day? Professor Ravi Gupta, otherwise known as Radhika Raman Prabhu. Brilliant. Um, what, what do you call someone... Uh, when they're a prodigy or something, when someone's like young and they're just like super incredibly talented. A prodigy, you call it a yeah. prodigy. You know, like a bhakti prodigy, right? He, he, a bhakti he, prodigy. He, 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 learned, he learned how to read and write and speak through Srimad Bhagavatam. He Did you ever practiced. like meet a person that at a young age and then you don't see him for years and you still think, yeah, what is he, 12 years old? <laughs> He's a man now. He's a man. He's a grown man. He's an adult male. <laughs> I knew him when he was 12 when he used he's to write for Back to God more mature than us <laughs> <laughs> and, he's uh, probably far more mature than us yes it's true I spoke with him oh, yesterday just to talk sad. about the subject of the show and he he, uh, he was so excited to speak about Srimad Bhagavatam you know that's just you know you grow up without all the garbage that we got stuck in our head you know and but beyond that you know he graduated from from Oxford at like 13 or 14 years old or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll get the bio details. We're going to call that a bhakti child prodigy. But um, it'll be fascinating to hear him speak. This man, he knows his stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so so he'll explain to us about Bhagavatam, about what it's all about, about, about bhakti. It, it'll be, it's going to be great. So please tune in. That's 8 a.m. tomorrow, 8 a.m. Eastern time. You guys won't be there. You know, we're going to be cruising through Arissa. Tell me the truth. Are you going to be shopping? Because if you're shopping, no, I think it's better. No, come tomorrow. To no shopping tomorrow. Really? Actually, you guys got to shop tomorrow. You got to get your pilgrimage clothes. Yeah, shopping tomorrow. We're shopping. <laughs> okay. um, okay, you know, he was probably smarter than me when he was 12. That's the sad thing. Well, it's not sad. There's no shame in that, Raghunath. There's no shame in that. No? All right. No. Let's get on with our questions, Prabhu. All right. Questions. This one's for both of us. No, look at you. Just jump is, right into it. Okay. This is from Iman. Iman from the UK via email, 921. Okay. Eamon? Or maybe Eamon. Eamon. Dear Raghunath Kostub and Mara, thanks so much for all the inspiration and wisdom you provide for myself and countless of others. I've taken so much encouragement and comfort from your daily podcast. Thank you, Thank Eamon. Eamon? Eamon. Eamon. My question. It seems to me that the vast majority of devotees find their way into Krishna consciousness at an early age. I'm reminded of how often Srila Prabhupada spoke about the young boys and girls who followed him in the early days. Well, I'm 54. Um, I'm 54 now, and I have finally thrown the towel in on Maya. I was first impacted upon the, by the writings of Srila Prabhupada some 25 years ago. But alas, thought I might have another way, another answer to finding inner peace and happiness. How wrong I was. 
Oh. But I have much to do and not so much time as I would have, as I would, as I guess what I would like to have. Can you offer me some advice to an old guy who's finally ready to progress as much as I can towards attaining a degree of Krishna consciousness? Talking to others about the spiritual life, I think that there might be many, many people like myself who have come to the same realization who are north of 50 and beyond. Perhaps an answer to this question might reach many others too. When I'm in the UK, I attend the temples and take prashadam with the devotees there. I volunteered at an eco farm for a month too. This was a good experience, but my desire to learn and grow continues. I have no dependence and can devote time. Is traveling to Vrindavan for some time a good idea? Perhaps a longer stay in an ashram that might look favorably on an older fella be a good idea. What do you think? Mm. That's Eamon. You want to answer that first? Good question. Good question, Eamon. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll get it started. Um, thank you, Eamon, for your question. And you know what? I, th you, I think what you're saying is true. You're not alone. A lot of people are um, discovering bhakti a little bit later in life. Um, here's, here's, my, here, here's where I'll start. When it comes to bhakti yoga, which means when it comes to reestablishing one's identity, right, in connection with with that divine root of all existence in, in a personal way, there's ne it's, it's always, everything is always hopeful, right? In one sense, the news is always good, right? So like you're saying, well, I, I'm this late in life. Now, for sure, it's true that it's advantageous to get into this early in life, no question, right? No doubt about that. But from from another angle, you can just say, as Raghunath sometimes says, you know, the um, the mysteries of the universe have landed on your lap. So that's good news. <laughs> At whatever age, if you're 99 years old, that's incredibly fantastic news, you know. Um, so that's that's one thing. And then the point is this, is that ideally in this lifetime, um, we can reach a point where a mind is... I don't know if, uh, let's say pure, right? And, and by, but, but by pure, what I mean is that the mind is peaceful in the sense that we're not full of resentment. We're not full of distraction. We're not riddled with desires that are um, informed by illusion. You know, we're, in other words, we're not confused about what will make me happy and what won't. So that the mind becomes very peaceful. And then when we do these practices like, the chanting of Krishna's names, the kirtan, you know, um, seeing the form of of the Lord in the, in the temple, um, hearing Shrima Bhagavatam, that, that when we engage the mind in it, that it becomes powerfully transformational, right? And and so the idea is we're work we're we're, we're working on the on the mind, we're working on on um on creating that space where the mind becomes deeply absorbed. And, and so that means purifying our existence, purifying how we see the world, letting go of so much. Now, everything that you've gone through in your 50 whatever years you've gone through, it might, you, you might look at it and say, oh, it was working in the wrong direction. But if you can look at that through new eyes, hmm. right, it, if, through eyes, through the eyes of knowledge, through the eyes of bhakti, then, then it, right now, you can benefit from all of that if it gives you a clear realization about life and if it helps you let go right now. Mm. And, and, and so you can turn all of that disadvantage into an advantage because Ooh. you really know it. You've been through it, you know? Flip and, it. And flip it. There you go. Flip it, right? And, and, and so, you know, I've shared that story about myself with, with my friend Jeeva G, who were friends when we were kids. And then I became a, a, a monk, a brahmachari, and, and began practicing bhakti at age 20 or so. And she, um, she, you know, she went through a lot of hard stuff in life, you know, and, and went another direction. But then we, our paths met again 30 years later, you know. And, um, and she was thinking, well, I, it seems like I've wasted all this time. But actually, she found a way to flip it. And she, so she's got, like, right in her heart and mind right now, she's determined. You know, she's, she's got the strong faith. And, and she's deeply engaged. So she, she flipped it. She turned all that into an advantage. And I think that's important. And, and remember, just remember this, that 
these practices like chanting and hearing Bhagavatam, they're very powerful. So they can work in an instant. We just mm -hmm. need to, to deeply embrace them, deeply absorb ourselves in them. I, I, I just wanted to read this little passage here. Uh, one of my favorite passages from the Bhagavatam, which is from the second canto, chapter eight. These are texts three through five, spoken by Maharaj Parikit, who is about to die, right? And he's speaking to Shukadeva Goswami, the super transcendental spiritualist speaker of Bhagavatam. So he says, oh, greatly fortunate Shukadeva Goswami, please continue narrating Srimad Bhagavatam so that I can place my mind upon the supreme soul lord krishna that's all we're trying to do right and being completely freed from material qualities thus relinquish the body hmm. persons who hear Srimad bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of god at sri krishna manifest in their hearts within a short time hmm. the sound incarnation of lord krishna the supreme soul enters into the heart of the self-realized devotee sits on the lotus of their loving relationship and thus cleanses the dust of material association such as lust anger and hankering thus it acts like autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water a pure devotee of the lord whose heart has once been cleansed by the process of devotional service never relinquishes the lotus feet of lord krishna for they fully satisfy them as a traveler is satisfied at home after a troubled journey. So you know, it so, sounds, yeah. it sounds like this Amen got some type of taste 25 years ago. And uh, you've probably seen this happen a lot of times because too, because you're, we're in the North of 50 club too. So uh, we see people who get some taste for it and then you just never hear from them again but they can't disappear because things made too much sense in bhakti. And mm -hmm. what happens is Krishna just gives them a, a long, long leash to play around in the material world. And they come back, just like you said, like sharp, really lucid, understanding the bitterness of the material world. And they come back and it's as if they never left, but they just had to take that, that, that scenic route through the material realm to come back right to right where they should have. And, uh, so I think this is the next question. So now what? What the heck is he supposed to do with his life? You're asking me or you're going to share? Are you going to tell me? Well, I could share, but uh, well, it is the question too. Well, so, so that's my point. You, you know, all of these practices, you're just, it's really just to get your mind and the heart in the right place, right? And, mm. then, and then once you're there, these practices are going to become really powerful. So practice chanting, practice hearing, really he hear those messages whatever you've learned from from like the way you're kind of presenting is almost like a life misspent in a sense is learn from it and, and, and when your conviction is completely strong you're going to be able to focus without distraction you know so mm. practice it and have faith that this is that these these are very very potent uh um practices you know mm. and and he was asking about is it a good idea to go to Vrindavan? definitely Definitely, but make sure you go with with the right people, right? Make sure you can, you go there with people that really know their way around and that are, can be really helpful to people that are really good practicing uh, bhaktas himself. Raghunath can you need you a, there. You need a guide when you go to the the dom. I, I, I'm, and I'm, if you live in the dom, which I, I, for someone who's if, if he's got no kids and no, why not go? If if, if you're going with the guide. And you just stay in the dom, or you're there under the shelter of senior devotees. That's a very beautiful way. Is the thing is like we're dealing with truth penicillin, you know, like it's like truth medicine. And sometimes it's almost like too big to swallow. And sometimes people are give me it all, give me all of it. I want it all right now. I don't want little tiny doses. I want it all. It really depends on the person. If you're ready to take the medicine, then yeah, you might have to just do some time, go into a holy place render service, find like-minded people you connect with that are spiritual. And that's a key thing. They've got to be like-minded people that you can really connect with, that you can trust, that you can hear from, that you can serve. And the mysteries of the universe will start to land on your lap, sink into your heart. And yeah, um, you're, that it, part of having a community 
is you can ask people who know you and know where you're at. There are certain people who would ask me, hey, I'm thinking about moving to Vrindavan. I'm thinking about moving to Mayapur. I'm thinking about moving to an ashram. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. You got to keep doing what you're doing and then add a little Krishna to your life. But there are certain people I'd say, now's the time. Mm -hmm. Cut the cut the attachment. And, um, you know, we tend to think, you, you know, he thinks, well, I'm old. I'm 54. Got news for him. You know, I'm here with Tommy, 17 years old from uh, Sacramento, California. If 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 Tommy is turning 18 tomorrow, if Tommy dies when he's 18 and a half, he's an old man today. That wasn't a curse, by the way. <laughs> You're not going to die. <laughs> it's a curse. But the fact is, he's an old man. We're only as old as how many more days do we have to live? The fact is, this truth is for everybody, and we all have to take it seriously. And if we don't want to take it seriously, that's fine. But then you have to deal with living in untruth. And I'm finding in my own life, any stress, any anxiety, um, any um, uh, internal pain, any anguish, any resentment, any bitterness I'm going through is Krishna himself first personally shoving the truth bomb down my throat. And I'm just like, I'm, I have, and if, if I don't just accept it, it's just going to manifest in stress. It, here's, here's just saying, if you have stress, anxiety, fear, overwhelm, guess what? You're getting hit by the truth bomb. You're getting hit by the truth hammer. And, and, and today we're going to just, just check it quick. Are you hangry again? I thought no, you just say I'm fully fed. I'm okay. fully fed. I'm just sort of worked up. I'm okay. just noticing this in my life. If I'm going through anything, it's Krishna trying to crack these layers of false ego that I have. Right. I have layers and layers of unreality, you know, outfits I'm wearing. And Krishna's just trying to crack that shell, like cracking a macadamia nut. It's like hard, hard shell. And then right. and then you open it up and there's another shell underneath that. And I'm I'm calling it fear, anxiety, or distress, or bitterness, or anger. Yeah. Yeah, because underneath there is something incredibly sweet, wonderful, nutritious, delicious. That's the spirit soul. Mm. And so let the material world shake it up. It's not a bad thing if you're going through stress, anxiety, bitter. This is a good thing. It's a good thing if you're if you're surrounding yourself with the Bhagavatam. That means you're on the accelerated path to pure, pure devotional service. So expect things to get stormy. It's going to get stormy. And that's what makes... Great sailors, you learn how to sail that storm. Don't get overwhelmed by the storm. You just hold on to that trail. Expect it. Does, spiritual life doesn't mean shanti. It's going to be peaceful. All your pay, problems are going to go away. When we chant the maha mantra, it, mean, it means bring it on, bring it on. I'm ready to get purified. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I I have to you want to smash the microphone so, now? <laughs> just like. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that truth bomb. I'm gonna swallow it, Raghunath. I'm gonna swallow. Swallow it. that truth bomb, Kastuba. Oh, okay. We're getting we're getting cracked open. We're getting cracked open. I've been really cracked this year, and you know what? It's a beautiful thing. It's not a horrible thing. It's a beautiful thing if I turn towards Maya in the midst of the cracking. If I just turn, it's okay. We're just reading the difference. I was reading this cool story about the difference between. Yeah. The queens hmm. of Krishna. They were all saying, oh, Krishna. Uh, there was, oh, they were saying to Draupadi. They were saying, Draupadi, why does Krishna love you so much? He's always so, he's uh, so, it's like you're his best friend. You're, you're so dear to Krishna. How can we become so dear to Krishna like you are? The queens of Drop, the queens of Krishna are saying that like that. And yeah. so Draupadi said, you know, I hear what you're chanting. You always say Krishna is mine. But I say, Krishna, I am yours. Like Krishna, what all my sorrows, all my joy, everything I have, I'm yours. I'm just your instrument. I'll take whatever you got. So if you got some sorrow, you got some pain, you got some hurt, you give that to Krishna. Krishna, you don't have to take away any of my pain. This is my pain, and I'm just taking full shelter of you. I am yours. Give me whatever you like, Krishna. I fully trust you. Mm. Nice. Mm. Thank Where'd you. you pick that up, Rogana? Uh, yeah, Instagram. Some sacred, some sacred book. Okay. Some sacred book that secret one yet you don't nice. know of. No, it's okay. Yeah. Now I got another question for you. Yes, sir. This is coming through Ananda Bihari's sage group. From that's Bihari's wife. 
Ananda Bihari. No, right, no, no, no. no. Ananda Bihari. Bihari. Ananda Bihari. Ananda Bihari. Okay, Ananda Bihari. Okay. So, uh, coming through Ananda Bihari Sage Group from okay. our daily Zoomer, Greg DeGesu. He's on here right now. Yeah. So, here we go. Okay, Greg asks, how do I know if I'm practicing detachment, performing my temporary dharma, or just trying to avoid taking responsibility for my family, job, bills, etc.? Mm, good question. What's good the difference question. between genuine detachment and uh, it doesn't matter mindset? And, uh, it's all Maya. You because know what? It, you um, know, that's a kind of a, a bypassing thing. It can be, right? That, that can really be spiritual bypassing. We were talking about that yesterday. It's so often I've seen people neglect their family and their careers and their, you know, their, their spouse, et cetera, mm -hmm. just because it's hard. It's hard to deal with a spouse. It's hard to deal with being a parent. It's hard to do. But we find ourselves getting pure through dealing with the dharma of this world. That's how we become purified. We don't get purified by just neglecting it. Now, it's a very few people when Krishna says, abandon all dharma and just surrender to me. It's very, very few people. Oftentimes, we just want an easy way out. And um, we find our, our, our purity coming from dealing with the responsibilities of this world and trying to put Krishna in there as well. I'm going through some pain. This guy's driving me crazy. This person's driving me crazy. How can I see Krishna's hand in this? And how will I treat them? That's a much better barometer for my spiritual life, then can I get rid of all my pain by just walking away from it? Mm. Let's deal with it in a responsible way. And there will be a time and it'll become very obvious because all your God brothers and God sisters and spiritual family say, it's time for you to fully renounce the world. There'll be a time for that, most likely. But oftentimes we have like a lot of serious material, material responsibility. Um, it, it appears material. Here's the interesting thing. It appears material. It's not dealing with little children. I, I mean, believe me, I've dealt with little children. <laughs> okay. God, you know, and it's sort of like this kid's crying. This kid's pooping. The dog's barking and needs to get it for a walk. I got one kid in each hand. I'm losing my mind. I can't even chant my rounds. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm ready to have a breakdown. And, you know, and my wife's still mad at me, even though I'm holding a dog and two kids. It's like, what the heck, Krishna? I should just neglect all this stuff. It's not spiritual whatsoever. It's completely spiritual. You just got to put a diff see it through a different lens. There's a different metric for my spiritual life. And it's going to be, can I do these duties and treat these people with the greatest dignity and take this as a purifying process? The material world is a purifying process and hold true to your spiritual values and your spiritual principles and your sadhana as best you can and move forward. It's not going to be you're alone, sitting peace. I've seen so many people walk away from important responsibilities in the name of spirituality only to get caught up in so much more nonsense. Anybody who's been around for 10 years or more has seen that happen. Right? Right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Come on. I've seen it. Be, things will become very, very obvious. All right. Is that, a is that, a, is that all right? <laughs> that was great. Answers? No, I thought it was really good. You know, I think on so many levels, what you said is valuable because um, there's this, what you're saying is so true that people do renounce in, in the name of spirituality. They renounce important responsibilities that they have, and they actually miss growing through them which is what's going to actually facilitate their deeper realizations. And, and therefore, Krishna says, you know, Krishna says in the 18th chapter that um, the duty, acts of sacrifice, charity, penance, they're not to be given up, right? Even it said, he says that they purify even the great souls. Right? Mm. But, but what you said was important, but they see it through a different lens. And I think the, the, what I was thinking of, of how, it's, um, how it works on an, in another way, everything that you're saying was sometimes people may think, they may go the other way and say, I have all these responsibilities. I guess I'm not going to be able to practice bhakti, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm busy 24-7 sure. here taking care of these kids, taking care of these responsibilities, going to work, doing all these things. I don't have time for I wish I did, but it's. I guess it's just not for me. It won't work for me. But what you're saying was, no, no, no. You still do all those responsibilities, but you see them in a different way. You see them through a different lens. 
and it all becomes part of your devotional service because no longer you're just taking care of two kids and a dog. You're taking care of Krishna's two kids and a dog. And -hmm. when you begin to think that way and see that way, then you transform all of your otherwise mundane duties into act offerings into acts of bhakti. Mm. There's, you know, there's yeah. some acts that are inherently um, devotional service, like reading Bhagavatam or doing kirtan, you know, like, right. And then there are other acts that aren't necessarily inherently, um, you know, bhakti related, but when they're seen through the lens of bhakti and turned into offerings, then they become bhakti. And so, uh, so everything that you're saying is, in, I think, important. Whether you're, whether you're misunderstanding and walking away from important duties and not growing through them, or whether you're saying, "I don't have time for bhakti because I got all these duties." No, see the duties in another way. I like that, Raghunath. Thank you. Yeah, and you, you know, let if you're focused on Krishna, Krishna will seep into the cracks. It just happens anyway. You know, mm-hmm. even if you have big responsibilities in the material world, if you're focused on Krishna, Krishna will get in there somehow as well. And and if you keep Krishna as your focus, eventually those very heavy burdens start to melt away. And of course, then there's then there's a, as we get older, Krishna gets louder and louder. By the way, if Krishna is not getting louder and louder, tapping us on the shoulder more seriously, giving us a little shake as we get older, we got to start hanging around with different people. Because the voice of Krishna should be coming more and more loud in our ears as we get older. Uh, you know, we're saying the North of 50 Club. It should be Krishna's voice should be very, very loud and very clear. We should know what our offering is at this point in our life. And we should, we, you know, we should talk to, devote, to devotees if we don't. We should say, what should I do? Where do you, where do you think I'm at? What, I can't you know, figure this out what's, on my own. What's my long-term help. plan? Help me, help me figure this out. And not any devotee. Find devotees that you like to trust. What do you think my long term plan is here? Hmm. Because because we don't want to miss this opportunity. And we can accelerate to Krishna as fast as we want to, but we have to want to. And you get to want to by associating with people that do want to. That's how you get to want to. That's how you develop that desire. You associate with people who have that desire. I'm sweating and say it loud. Again. Ragnar, say, say it. So that voice of <laughs> God is, is really loud right now. It's coming through loud and clear. <laughs> I'm in Hastinapur. I can't help it. Arjuna was from here. Oh. Okay. You guys are having a good what time over got? there, aren't you? I can feel it. I can feel you're excited. You're well, we didn't even start. We didn't but even still. start. It's about to get real, real good, real quick. You're excited. I can see that. I, I'm really excited. I, I've got, I've, I've been meditating on Jagannathpur for the last month. Okay. Okay, Greg was happy with your answer. Okay, Greg, thank you. This is from Jujitsu Nath, <laughs> Matt Godden, a.k.a. Makunda. Yeah. Where is he? Is he in here? He's in the back. He's way by the door. It's Jujitsu Nath's day. Okay. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. This is for Kastuba. All right. I have another question. This one could be answered by the board, by the board or the Q&A day. We'll oh, you put on the doing a Q and A. So, okay. Okay, great. From my understanding, Maya bodies mm-hmm. think they are God or will become God. How is it that they believe that one Maya body and a and a group of their Maya body friends will all become God? <laughs> God is singular, but they are plural. I try to usually understand other points of view, but I'm failing here. Thank you. Help me understand. Maya bodies. Let's do that. Uh, so yeah, the term here, Mayavadi, like a, a Mayavadin, they're they're subscribing to a, a particular um, doctrine, I suppose you could say. Can I, can I ask you a question first? Yeah. Are do they call themselves Mayavadis, or is that like a pejorative, like you Mayavadi? I don't think it has to be a pejorative, but it's kind of used that way sometimes. But you know, yeah, they're they're you know, Avadin is is a person that is subscribing to a particular teaching or doctrine and yeah and mayavad means people will interpret it different ways but i think perhaps the most common is that they see every they see everything as illusion right like this is all illusion or that for instance like krishna's form any form illusion any relationship illusion any individuality illusion 
Whereas there's another school of Vedanta that says, no, 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 there is such a thing as spiritual form. There's such a thing as spiritual relationship like that. Um, so, so, you know, perhaps a more, um, a, something to escape any potential pejorative kind of sense to it would be to say like an Advaitiv, an Advaitin, right? A monist, a person that subscribes to Advaita Vedanta. They believe that mm -hmm. everything is one. And so that goes to, to um, Mukunda's question here, where he's asking um, that my violins think that they are God or will become God. How is it that they believe that, that one Mayavadi and a group of their Mayavadi friends will all become God? God is singular. Here come the Mayavadi crew. Plural. Hey, the Mayavadi friends are here. <laughs> so, so the point is this. If you read Vedanta, you can read the Upanishads, you can read the Vedanta Sutra, and then you can <clears> read... Um, books like Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, all these texts, you know, are a broader part of Vedanta. Um, they're going to speak in terms of who we are and who God is in different ways at different times. And sometimes, and this is the thing, it's subtle. There's a oneness and there's a difference. Some mm -hmm. of the verses that we read will emphasize the oneness because we are made of God's energy. We are God's energy. And if we are God's energy, in a sense, we are God. <laughs> mm. Raghunath, you're God. Mara, you're God. I always thought I was God. <laughs> okay. But, but we're not, we, but at the same time, we're different. Okay, so it's like sometimes perhaps the most helpful analogy is that of the sunshine and the sun, right? The, the one is the origin and, and one is the energy of that origin that emanates from that origin, right? The sunshine, the sun is not dependent on the sunshine. It's not the effect of the sunshine. It, rather, it's the other way around. But they're both made of the same energy, right? They both have the same qualities, heat and light. So is sunshine sun? Well, yes and no, right? It's like it's mm. both, right? Now... Mm. Now, the Mayavadins or the Advaita Vedantins, they really stress the oneness and they eliminate the difference. And so, that, so when, when, when uh, Mukunda is asking about like how if God is one and, and, and these individual um, Advaitin Vedantins and a you know, group of friends, if they're plural, well, then how can plural be one? Well, they're, what they're saying is that any conception of plurality is illusion. Mm -hmm. That actually is not that they actually are not separate. That and honestly, you know, I consider this philosophy to be very, you know, like um, it's it's kind of like let's all twist our minds and try to believe stuff that really doesn't, you know. There's a lot of beautiful teachings that are coming from Advaita Vedantins that they share. That they, they, there's a lot of brilliant thinkers that that will propound it and explain a lot of important points in really well, you know? Um, but I think this is, I'm going to share with you my own opinion, right enough, okay? What's your opinion? Well, we say that, that um, attachment clouds truth perception, you know? Mm. And, and my belief is that, you know, if you look at Bhagavatam where everything becomes clear, because it, it, the, the whole point is Bhagavatam was saying, okay, some of you are thinking it's one. Some some of you are thinking it's many. You know, some of you think that you are God. Some of you think that you have an eternal relationship with God. Okay, I I understand. Vyasadeva is saying I understand that you become confused by reading my books because I'm emphasizing different things at different times. I'm going to clear it up for you now. I'm going to write the Srimad Bhagavatam where I kind of give a lengthy commentary on Vedanta Sutra so that it all becomes abundantly clear, right? And um. And, and so there it's described that you can understand right off the bat, you know, it's described Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavanati Shabdate, that the absolute truth or God can be understood in three features. There is that oneness, there's that God's energy is everywhere. There's God within the heart, and then there's the person, God. Right. And and, and so that person, that can be disconcerting for people, that can be challenging to people. That there is a person who I'm dependent on eternally who's more powerful than me, who I am just the energy of, but I am not that 
I'm never going to get above that person. I'm never going to get around that person. That can be psychologically challenging. Well, for two big reasons. One, because we've all probably suffered from some type of bitter relationship with a higher right. authority. Right. It could be sure. a boss, professor, parent, teacher, crazy uncle, whatever it is. We've suffered in that situation. Then there's the if we grew up in a religion where God was, um, you know, a sadistic, cruel, I need to fear him. He's ready to punish me and kick my ass if I do something wrong. He's a really cruel judge. He's super harsh on me. That type of relationship with the concept of a higher power makes me want to be. No, we're all God. We're all light. God is love. We are love. I am love. One love, et cetera. I'm That's a great way for me to like really um, think that all this God is a person or a yeah. being. No, I'm, I'm sick of beings. Right. I want to just be. You know, we're going to just just the other day, I for the first time I heard a, a I don't know if it was a Bengali or a Hindi adage. You heard, yeah, what is it? And uh, but essentially it was saying um, it's like blowing on a lassi. <laughs> that caught your attention. <laughs> Lassie, eh? did you say? Lassie? Someone say Lassie. <laughs> so Lassie is a, cooling, is a cooling drink, right? Yes. And, and um, but say you drank a hot drink and you burned your mouth on it. Now you're thinking, mm. oh, drinks burn my mouth. And then you're holding a Lassie and you're blowing on the Lassie because you think it's going to, no, Lassie is going to cool your, your, cool you down, right? Uh -huh. So, so like you were saying, like, you know, we, we go through this world, we have difficult relationships, we have authorities that we have problems with, you, you know, we, we have relationships that we have problems with, we identify problems with authority problems with relationships. No, it's just like all drinks don't burn your mouth, all relationships don't burn you, right? All sure. authorities don't burn you. So you're hearing about Krishna and Bhagavatam, and you're <laughs> You know, this God figure this is going to be horrible. It's just, no, Krishna's it's sweet. Crazy. You don't have to blow sweet. on Krishna. Krishna's very sweet. It's very sweet. It's quite very adorable. Sweet. He's not here to punish you. Yeah. Krishna's not Judge Judy. Krishna's loving. He's got, adorable. His, charming. His, his feet are like millions of cooling moons, right? They're satisfying. Hmm. And all. So, so, so my point being is that when I look at people that interpret Vedanta, were they, you see, because to have a complete view of it, a thorough, a mature view of it, you have to look at the oneness that's spoken about in Vedanta, and you have to also look at the difference that's spoken about in Vedanta, and you have to find a way to unify both of these ideas. And so that's done so clearly through Bhagavatam, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, and, and, and through great commentators on these books. So that you're going to say, mm -hmm. yes, we are God, we are all one in one sense, because we're all made of the same energy. But at the same time, as Krishna will say in Bhagavad Gita, that um, what is it, Mamai Vangsho Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, that the living entities in this material, they're my et eternally my fragmental parts, Krishna says, right? Eternally, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, eternally. Mm. So, so there are there are many clear, unambiguous statements uh, in, in Vedanta that will say that we have an eternal individual identity. There are other verses that are going to emphasize the oneness because that's important to understand too. It's, it's important that I understand I'm made of God's energy. That means I am eternal. That means by nature, mm. I'm full of knowledge. By nature, I'm blissful. So my understanding that I am, quote unquote, God in that way, that I'm God's energy, it's very important for me to understand who I am, what I'm made from, and, and, and what I'm meant to be experiencing right now. Well, this is important because there's, we, we live in a world where oftentimes we haven't had a, you know, a loving or present uh, parent figure mm -hmm. representing, representing love. They just were not in my life. And therefore, we suffer from uh, a lot of self-doubt, if not self-loathing. And when I understand that, I actually, <laughs> yeah. huh? Or maybe they were a little too much in your life. <laughs> or they made a little too much in your face and in your life. Right. So with that self-loathing, I have to understand, well, what am I anyway? What am I hating? I can't hate myself and love God because mm. I'm part of God. Right. So therefore, my very worth is my birth. I'm part of God. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a beautiful spiritual being. And even whatever the behavior is that I have or whatever I've done in the past, I'm a beautiful spiritual being. And I want to get back on track. 
We're driving Lamborghinis, but sometimes we're driving them all over the road. You know, we're a spiritual being and we just forgot. And due to some, due to some, some scar or some um, issue we grew up with or l- lack of love, I have some self hate and it's, uh, I, I can't hate myself and expect to move forward on my spiritual path. With Thank you, you. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, you, you know, um, it's th- this, this um, literature, this Vedic literature, this Vedanta is so vast, right? And as we've spoken about in the past, and, and I'm sure that um, that our guest tomorrow, uh, you know, Ravi Gupta, the professor, he could have a lot to say on this. Um, but the tr- we, we have to try to get to the essence of things, and we have to try to be mature. It means we have to be detached to, 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 to say whatever truth may be, I want to find it. Not that I want to find truth that conforms to my attachments, but I just want to find truth. And and if we look at the entire of Vedanta, we're going to see that there's so many unambiguous statements about not only our oneness, but our difference, our individuality, our eternal individuality as well. And mm-hmm. but 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 we don't have to blow on the lassi, right? Our our attachments are our aversions, which are just the opposite side of attachment, right? Like what we don't want to experience. That, that can cloud that clarity. And so when, when I hear things about a, a lot of the Advaita Vedanta teachings, I say, like for instance, I, was, I recently heard uh, an Advaita Vedanta speaking on the idea of free will. And, Tell me. The, the, and it, it was a great speaker, brilliant man. But at the end, like the point was, he was saying that we don't have free will actually, because if you go back into our samskars, there's always something before it that caused it. And, and um, he said, but we should act as if we have free will so that we can get to the point where there's no will. And I said, well, but you see, if, if you don't have free will, <laughs> you can't choose to act as if you do. You know? Right. And, and, and why should we assume that we ever come to a point where we don't have will if we if are made no free, of the energy of God? Yeah. If there's no free will, there's no choice. Yeah. And, and so how can I choose to act as if I do? Yeah. And so I find that the way to Vedanta teachings, they can be fascinating and, and even presented in brilliant ways, but it's but they kind of ask us to bend our minds in ways that really don't make sense sometimes. And, and the most fundamental question is, well, if I'm God, how did I end up in so much illusion and why am I suffering? Mm. Right? How did that happen? How is there an energy that's more powerful than me that's 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 um, covered my clarity you know covered my perception that's caused my suffering you know that's the, just a the fundamental question how is and, god an illusion and there's not a satisfying answer to that question the answer will be well, well this is leela but that's that's taking from the bhakti vedantins and, and it makes sense when the bhakti vedantins say because krishna will go into illusion to enjoy rasa to for, for deep pleasure but when i have a toothache you know that's there's no there's no pleasure in that you know why would God come and suffer the way that we suffer voluntarily, it's it's there's really no good answer to that question and, and yeah. a lot of times I find that the way to Vedanta they ask you to just kind of like um, it's almost like shut off your your discrimination your your discernment mm-hmm. you know uh, so that we can continue to buy into this idea that I am God, that there is no being beyond me that there is no being superior to me, so. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I appreciate a lot of Advaita Vedans. I truly do. You know, I, I, I appreciate um, their dedication. I appreciate their, a lot of their qualities. Sometimes you meet an Advaita Vedanta, they're intelligent, they're, they're, they're um, kind, they're, they're um, gentlemanly or lady, you know, they have good qualities. But I, I can't accept the teachings. To me, it's just, it's, it's asking me to give up my discernment and, and uh, and I and I don't feel the need to blow on the lassie. Yeah. Hashtag don't be a Maya body. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Don't blow on the lassie. Don't, don't blow on the Maya lassie. bodies. Speaking of lassie. Speaking of lassie. <laughs> that's the lastie. I think that's the lastie. Okay, that's the, the question. That's the last one for Rabu. Today. And you're gonna you're gonna solo it tomorrow without us. We're gonna be on an adventure. I'm gonna miss you and, guys. Uh, oh, we're gonna miss you, Kostuba. 
Um, live from our hotel room, we have a bunch of very jet lagged people here right now. They're falling asleep while they're chanting their japa, while they're listening to class. They're all nodding off, one eye open. <laughs> Kristen Ryder, come on, wake up. <laughs> it's okay. I get it. Thanks for joining us, everybody. What's he what saying here? Right now? Age, age, straight, straight. Age, age means up ahead. Yeah. Age, age, gaya. The, cow, the cows are up front. Oh. Age, age, gaya. Age, age. Okay. Um, I just say age when I want the, the rickshaw wallow to go straight. Age. Yeah, you want him to go straight. Age, age. And 